Hello, and welcome to uh, What Now, a video interview series brought to you by Michigan Future, a nonpartisan think tank devoted to a more prosperous Michigan. I'm Sarah Sherpicki, the Vice President of Michigan Future and the host of What Now. What Now is inspired by the global coronavirus pandemic and the spotlight it's shining on issues that we believe were already urgent in our economy and our communities. The truth is, even before the pandemic, there was a lot that wasn't working for far too many people. In each series of What Now, we'll discuss ideas that should be applied today to help us navigate the pandemic, but that should also be a part of any recovery strategy. In our first series, we're focusing on education. The coronavirus pandemic is likely to widen the opportunity gap between affluent and non-affluent and white and non-white students. But um, the greatest losses are likely to be worse than we know and hidden because they're losses in skills that aren't measured on standardized tests. Uh, we think it's really important that we're paying attention to these critical skills that kids need to be successful in the future. Today, I'm gonna to be talking with David Gamlin, the Executive Vice President of the Midnight Golf Program here in Detroit. Uh, Dave has been in the role there and in his role at Midnight Golf since 2001. Midnight Golf is focused on the successful transition of high school students to college, through college, and ultimately to career opportunities. He leads the programming, develops the mentors, and facilitates the program's evaluation. Over 3,200 youth have been part of Midnight Golf since its inception. Uh, Dave began his career, though, as a global equity trader for two major Wall Street investment firms. Um, and has served in corporate leadership with automotive suppliers and worked with New Detroit, focusing on education and policy and youth development. Um, I've gotten to know Dave because of our um, co-participation in a learning community focused on the critical skills that kids need to be successful. Um, and one thing that you see that happens in those conversations a lot is that kids get sort of reduced to numbers and statistics, like what percentage of the class did this or that. Um, and what I think is remarkable is that while Dave can talk about numbers, he never does it in a way that is reductive to kids. And so um, he speaks about kids as whole human beings who have like their own purpose and desires and, and who deserve um, to have all the opportunity in the world. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you, Dave, for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so, Dave, for viewers who aren't familiar with Midnight Golf and aren't from Detroit, um, mm -hmm. why don't you talk a little bit about Midnight Golf and about the kids that you work with? Great. So, uh, again, thanks. It's an honor to be here. Just really glad to see you. I know we haven't seen each other in person in a while, so uh, even if it is virtual, uh, it's still um, always good to connect. Uh, Midnight Golf has been around since 2001 and started really um, – as an outgrowth from the profession, PGA of America. They wanted to do something special for the city of Detroit uh, when they were gonna host the Ryder Cup here. And so um, met with Renee Fluker, who founded the program back then. And uh, her son was a golfer and through uh, his inspiration um, and really his, his playing golf, she kind of took on the role and started a program that was really focused kind of similar to the model of midnight basketball, which is sport and life skill. Mm -hmm. um, what the difference was is that golf is really difficult to play at night. So even though <laughs> while we're called midnight golf, we always have to answer the question, do you play golf at night? And no, we don't. <laughs> but we do, um, we did follow and still follow the, the notion of golf or sport and life skill or some kind of training. The training for us has really come in a few directions, but mostly around this college success space, mm -hmm. helping students transition. We think one of the more critical transitions from high school to college, helping them find their way and, and find their voice, find their strength, their agency, how they belong, where they belong, what they want to do with their lives. And really uh, what we hear more often than not is this level of encouragement that comes um, to... Uh, but that's different than most uh, youth development programs. It's one that has a belief in the young people, uh, the kind that helps them understand or believe uh, is a better way to say it, that they could do whatever they put their minds and energy to. Um, and so our program kind of follows that suit. We've been um, successful in working with about 3,200 students uh, that have gone on to college. Don't want to, we know, argue with people who suggest perhaps, you know, all high school seniors shouldn't go to college. Um, that's not a debate we care to engage in. 
Our work, however, is to help those who do want to go to college, get there, stay there, graduate, not have to graduate with a whole bunch of debt to minimize that. And then at the end of the day, begin the career. Um, a lot of students don't know that the career part of the post-college experience starts the day you enter college. And so just understanding how to break down the strategy about career success uh, and through college is a, is, a, is a big part of what we do because we're wrapped in this whole notion of, well, those, to, to give you a little bit about the structure, the core program is a year long where we meet with uh, probably uh, about, usually about 250 students. I'll talk later about how we've evolved during the pandemic, but around 250, 260 students. We intentionally um, make the group half male, half female. And then we intentionally have students from the metropolitan Detroit area. So we have students from Detroit public schools, private charters, every school, uh, and have had probably students from more than 80 different high schools mm -hmm. over the years. When you bring together this kind of uh, blend of these different cultures, and that's where the nuances get a little fuzzy for people. They don't know that they're deep nuances. If you don't know Detroit, you don't know that there's a big difference between being an East Sider and a West Sider. I don't know if that's real or perceived, but it's something that people deal with. If you're from the suburbs, you know, the, the, I, we need to know what suburb. It's no such thing as you're from the suburbs. That doesn't make sense. It's a big difference between Gross Point, West Bloomfield, between Southfield and Warren, between Inkster and Belleville. And we have students from all of those cities, between Redford, and I could keep going. And so we have a real interesting mix of culture that comes to Midnight Golf which actually feeds everybody because now you get to thrive in, in a new culture. And if you know anything about going to college, that's kind of what it's about, entering a new culture and knowing how to get along. So they get a little head start in that. And then all the professional development skills, the etiquettes, the, uh, the learning how to speak, the, the networking, the negotiating, the financial management, you got to start doing adult things fairly quickly, uh, especially seeing that you're making usually the largest investment financially you've ever made in your life. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really what Midnight Golf is about um, mm -hmm. at its core. And then we extend that support throughout their college experience. We don't stop once we have them. That you see, that we start with their senior year in high school, and we will stay with them probably five, six, seven, eight years, depending on how long their education or career pursuit is. But it is not un uncommon for us to have students that we're continuing to be engaged with after 10 years. Mm -hmm. But the real zeroing in on the program Helps them find a college, get there, afford it, um, enroll. And then we stay with them as in stay in communication with them throughout that experience. So if they're having any kind of challenges, we help them navigate those challenges. And because of that, you know, more than 70% of our students have college degrees after mm -hmm. six years. Mm -hmm. And we're pretty proud of that. Yeah. Um, so I think a really important sort of learning in, in education in the last like 20 years has been sort of um, how just academic preparedness like isn't enough to get people, uh, it might get people to college, but not through it. Um, and I, it feels like your program is, was really built around understanding that already. Um, so what are some of the, um, some of the skills that you think kids like really need to be prepared with or that, or that you see um, them uh, really contributing to their success once they're in school? Right. You're hundred percent right. Academic preparedness isn't enough. I mean, not only is it enough, we've been doing that forever and it has worked. So, right. um, so that's really not even the point. And, but people were evaluating students like that. Like if you get good grades, you'll do well. That doesn't mean anything. Um, it can be an indicator. I get that part, but in terms of success, you really need to have some other things going for you. And this is where we zero in. Um, I really don't care where you go to school. There's very few high school students that know how to study uh, at a college level. Mm -hmm. They know how to pass classes in high school, but college level study skills are an entirely, it's an entirely different skill set that nobody teaches you. Mm -hmm. And if you're fortunate enough to find a peer group of people that can help you, um, you know, join the group study sessions, well, first of all, you got to find out how you learn. And so you, if, you've ever been to, if you've ever been to a college library, the group spaces, there are closets where one person can study because they have to accommodate all, accommodate all those learning styles. Mm -hmm. So it's helping them understand how they learn, but most of all, understanding what college level study skills are about, which are entirely different. Number two is time management. 
um, most uh, college students, they, you know, you're used to somebody telling you what to do every day, all day. And so when you have class on Monday and Wednesday, you think you only had two classes and there's some sort of abbreviated learning going on and you didn't know you were supposed to do eight hours of studying behind those eight hours, you know, those four hours in the classroom or two hours in the classroom. Again, not understanding that they, they really don't even know how to manage that time. Um, it's also very, a very social time. So if you have friends or situations that come up, um, it's really difficult if you haven't been in that, through that experience to know how to um, edit that stuff, how to push it away, how to navigate you know, uh, you know, you don't have to go to a party. The car, a party will come to you. And so how do you, how do you manage that? Um, yeah. And then finally, communication. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, um, you know, one of the mantras in our program is, listen, I, don't, I didn't make it up, but you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. You have to have agency. You have to know how to speak up for yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to know that you're the customer. You're the client. They owe you certain things. And if you aren't getting them, how to stand up and get what you need. Um, that is, is still a very strong skill that, uh, that we teach our young people, but they have a very difficult time even implementing because that level of agency, you don't always feel like, um, um, I guess kind of like that's your place. It, it's just this, this kind of child adult thing we do. Yeah. For high school kids that um, you can't take that to college. That's, uh, that's for high well, school. I'm also thinking about some of the non-cognitive skills that have been sort of shown to be um, really relevant and, and that just a sense, actually, this isn't really a skill, it's a mindset, but of belonging in an academic institution. And I'm wondering if, um, if it's more likely that Detroit kids are going to get to a higher level, um, a higher learning institution and not quite feel that sense of belonging. Um, and so they're going to have to advocate for themselves, despite wondering, do I really belong here? So have you seen that? Oh, without question, without question. Um, students have to find that. And so that's part of our, our training as well, is to how, how do you find your tribe, if you will? How do you, how do you find your group of friends uh, that are going to take you where you belong? Belonging is also something that is uh, uh, also challenged by our culture. And so, you know, when students go to predominant, you know, students where the culture is different from who they are, can oftentimes feel out of place. They don't know the language or how to move and engage. Um, but we, again, think that experience in, in uh, Midnight Golf at least gives them a bit, a sense of that. You know, the number one school for Midnight Golf students is Michigan State University. And they thrive at Michigan State University. But they know how to go find their places to plug in. There's so many things you can do if you know um, how to plug in. And Michigan State has all kinds of cultures. They have a huge global community that's part, part of their experience. And then there's the historically black colleges and universities um, that um, many African-American students in particular find they find comfort there because they are treated a, an entire, in an entirely different way mm -hmm. um, by and large. Um, but that's not necessary. I mean, it's great. But, the, but there's greatness in all these institutions. Everybody's usually proud when they get their degree. So um, that's the key, getting your degree. So the trick is get in there and find out where you belong, mm -hmm. um, where, where you um, find value. It starts with you. Once you get comfortable with who you are, uh, then it's not, will you accept me? It's like, I'm here now. It's just, just a different kind of image yeah. Yeah. that we've been guilty of. Uh, infusing in our students which is this 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 sense that i i am somebody and and i'm i'm powerful and i'm strong and it started with hey i made it in the midnight golf there's actually some cachet in that mm -hmm. um well and i've understood um when you've talked about midnight golf that the relationships between the students and the mentors and also the staff the whole team around midnight golf are mm -hmm. are really critical so what are those how do you think about leverage building and leveraging those uh, we, you know, obviously we, uh, you know, just ingrain that that's a huge part because there's a couple of kind of mentors you have the, the adult mentors that help the career mentors that can kind of come out of the adult mentor group. And then there's a real strong uh, push towards peer mentoring. Mm. We have young mentors who serve in many ways like near peers because uh, about 15, 20 of our 15 or so of our mentors are alumni from Midnight Golf. So they're early career professionals. Mm -hmm. And uh, it hasn't been that long since they were actually in their seats. So 
that near peer, well, peer mentoring is a, a thing. Near peer is a thing. Adult peer mentor, adult mentoring is a thing. And then career mentoring. Mm -hmm. And we try to make sure all those elements, they all have their place. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all really critical to building the sense of, one is about purpose, one is about belonging, one is about value, and one is about trajectory. And so, and I, I don't know if I said it in order, but they, pro, they each provide a unique place in your, um, in your personal development. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned that years ago. I feel like our culture and a lot of what we sort of teach young people is like how important it is for them to be independent. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the idea that they can build their own community of people who are interdependent with them and who can support them. Um, I mean, it, that was a missing idea when I was a kid, you know, and so um, I, I just think that's so powerful. I appreciate that because we uh, push back on that whole independence thing. Uh, we are all interdependent. There's yeah. nothing I, and I, it's almost like somebody tricked them into believing I got, I'm going to do it by myself. I don't need anybody's help. I want to stand on my own. Like, what does that have to do with success? I don't know anybody that's successful that did it on their own. Mm. Um, everybody has helped somewhere. Yeah. Um, we'll talk a little bit, if you would, about sort of your career and the skills that were really important to you. Well, I started, I have a degree in international business in French as a double major from uh, Hillsdale. I went to Harvard for community problem solving. And, um, it was a great time in education, I, you know, to do all those sorts of things. But I immediately went to Wall Street. I went to, to learn how to help people manage money. And I um, was uh, very successful at that for a number of years. I helped manage the city of Detroit's pension fund mm -hmm. and, uh, and had quite a career in, in finance. And that was really where I was grounded in actually the identical principles that rule <laughs> in that golf in terms of how we de deliver the program and prepare. Uh, there's a rule in investing. Uh, the number one thing every broker knows is, is know your customer. I actually still brought that to Midnight Golf. I really mm -hmm. believe in knowing the young people. When I mm -hmm. talked about those nuances between the communities and the schools and young women and young men, those are all real to me. Yeah. I know that there's really, you know, nuggets and nuances that shape who we are. It's not a whole lot of folks, you know, one like the other. That's, it's not a lot of that. It's a lot of very unique people, still interdependent, but very unique. So mm -hmm. I brought that. The other one, uh, was probably the easy stuff you have to do in, in money management, which is networking. Mm -hmm. um, I, I learned that um, you just had to learn how to get along with people and and uh, networking, but not networking, like meeting people and finding out what they could do for you. Yeah. Um, it was actually reversed for me. And I was, I'm sure it was some great book I read somewhere, but it really worked, which is networking and finding out what I can do for you. Mm -hmm. Um, I always network with people where I could add value to their life. Um, the part about them adding value, uh, it it's almost like like building a mouth. And it could or could not come, but it's the key was to help add value to other people's lives. Yeah. And that worked very well. And then, um, you know, from there, uh, same thing. I was in, it ran a couple companies and one in manufacturing and one in, um, well, both of them were in a form of manufacturing and, and the same kind of thing, really understanding people and appreciating who they were. There's another saying in business that if you're not in the people business, you're not in business. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it really helped to have this sensitivity and the sympathy and this heart for people um, because um, I've worked with people, I've worked with people who made minimum wage employees and I've had employees who made in excess of six figures. I've had employees who made hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and you have to know how to talk to everybody. You've got to understand kind of how they move and breathe. And when that really is the difference in, um, in what I think is your capacity to reach people and help them, help them be who they are. So that's, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Well, it's interesting as you, um, as you talk, so you're familiar with the framework that Michigan future is like, so um, enamored of, which is the six C's, that those are sort of the skills that matter for the future. So those are communication, collaboration, content, uh, critical innovation, or creative innovation, critical thinking, and confidence. And as you were talking, I was just thinking like, you're describing sort of being good with people, being able to get to know people and talk with everybody. That, that's like the, the peak of putting all six of those skills together. So when you've talked about, you know, you're familiar with this framework, does that, does that framework of the six C's, um, like, 
overlay with midnight golf? Like, how does it align? And and what did learning about it, um, like, make you think about your work at midnight golf? Right. It it aligned uh, directly with what we have been doing for years, and it was it was uh, you know I, I'll just be candid with you. It was really rather comforting. Mm-hmm. You know, we we've gone a long way to study and research the best practices in youth development. Um, as we grew, we, you know, we kind of knew what we were doing, but beyond that, like, how do you really make it great? How do you really dial in? And so, you know, we've done so much research around best practices and from Search Institute to the Gates Foundation and and all in between there. um, um, And, and learn that um, we were right on track. We were right on the mark doing what was required there's always these interpretations, though, of what those kind of gray words mean. They're not gray to me because, you know, when you say confidence, um, you know, confidence is one of those words where some people will say, you know, well, we're confident we're meeting the kids' needs. Like, that's not what it means. <laughs> it means are the students confident, you know? Right. Um, and so, you know, when I, when I see them stand up for themselves and move differently, that's what it means to me. When I see creativity, you know, we, a lot of people don't know Midnight Golf, we have a public speaking and, and writing projects, but we also have a poetry competition. Mm. A poet that doesn't even, yeah, it does. If you try to, but we've been doing that for years mm-hmm. uh, because we always knew that if you could incite that creative uh, element, sometimes you've, people could find that they actually were creatives, but most importantly, it would add a skill to their, their sense of, of, uh, of doing because Oftentimes you got to think outside the box to solve things, to navigate. And that we just knew that that's nurturing, especially if you're not a poet, because like I have no skill for this, but you have to do it anyway. And so that's, that was really the purpose behind that. So, I mean, I want to shift, I guess, to kind of this current moment we've been talking about sort of the Mm -hmm. pre pandemic. So like, how are your kids doing? (laughs) <laughs> How are the kids doing right now? That's, that's a really good question. And um, there's, there's not a, um, I guess I'm a little surprised at the span of reaction. Mm. Um, because not only are they doing certain ways, but their families are doing certain ways. Uh, so a lot of times with how they're living is put upon them because... Yeah. My mom doesn't want to leave the house. And so their whole life has changed because they don't really feel a certain type of way, but because they're thoughtful about their, their parents or how they're, you know, the people that live around them are deciding to move or not move, mm-hmm. um, you know, so it's changed their lives. So, you know, it's, I got, a, you know, dozens of stories in and around how people's worlds have been flipped upside down. Um, we got through the emergency part where, uh, you know, campus was immediately closed. You know, we immediately went to um, virtual programming last year we canceled our college tour. So it was fairly dramatic on our end, mm-hmm. just at the local programming level. So the colleges that we were hearing, they were falling like dominoes all across mm-hmm. the country. And in terms of like shut down, shut down, shut down. And so these students were scrambling. We talk about resilience, scrambling. To, like, what do I do with my television in my bed? You know, like, no, leave campus right now. It was <laughs> really super dramatic. And yeah. uh, most of them did quite well. We had to help with quite a few of them, but they did really well in, in kind of getting through that. Now, how does that translate into now? Um, they are, um, many of them, uh, it's more than 60. We did a survey, the, um, collected some data. More than 60% of our students are, are uh, it's probably closing in on 70% now. We're going to college virtually. And the difference is some, some are going virtually more than 60%, or well, about 60% are going virtually in Detroit. So they stayed home, mm-hmm. but they attend Spelman. They stayed home, but they attend Howard University. And then they're ones who went to the cities, like they went to East Lansing and they live in an apartment, but they're still going to school virtually. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but, but the virtual education is, is pretty, pretty commonplace. And that is problematic um, in and of itself because I don't know that they did enough study on how long somebody can stare in a computer screen, but to hear <laughs> six, seven, eight hours a day looking at a laptop, that seems crazy to me. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how anybody would, could be expected to really genuinely learn in an environment like that. How is, has Midnight Golf pivoted? Like, what are you guys doing now? 
Right. So we uh, we had a couple of thoughts this year. We were we were going to suspend our uh, our programming for a year. Mm-hmm. We have uh, about you know over a thousand students that are in college all, all across the country at over a hundred different colleges. So we were like, uh, this year we're going to focus on the throughput. We're just going to focus yeah. on college students. Make sure they're doing well. Make sure we're putting things in place. Go visit the universities. Talk to the presidents. Talk to the um, deans of colleges and learn what we could learn so we're better prepared to send them off and we're better prepared to direct students in their direction. Um, you learn a lot when you visit people in person, a lot about the cultures and things. So that's what we were going to do this year. Um, mm. And then it kind of hit us that um, because, we, you know, this whole virtual thing, we, you know, the capacity to, re- to really deliver our programming virtually is is... It's not even, it doesn't even resemble what we do. Yeah. So we weren't going to do it at all. And then we just realized that, that um, um, we, if, we, if we were going to do it, we had to do it for a smaller number. So we reduced our cohort size by 20%. Mm-hmm. And this is just for the spacing requirements. And if we were going to do it, we um, needed to focus on kids, young people that had just a little bit more resilience because we work with all kinds of students and maybe some who have self-esteem issues and the like, but if they don't have to have that kind of going already in this year, it's going to be really hard for them to get anything mm-hmm. seeing that you've been on a computer all day to get on a computer again and learn some more stuff mm-hmm. um, and then find that. And we knew we had to have some semblance of in-person, even if it was five people in a room at a time or five people together. Mm-hmm. at a time and golf is one of those things that allowed us to do that so we've trimmed our in-person programming from six hours a week to about an hour a week in person mm-hmm. uh, widely spaced um, and, and super safe and then um, even our in-person learning the life skills we're packing those up and putting them kind of webinar style so the students we've got this we learned this from the colleges um, you can watch at your leisure, but then we're going to come together for engaging conversation yeah. about, about what you were supposed to learn. So, so we have a couple of things going on, our mentoring, that's kind of how that works. And then a golf lesson. And then the training is coming in links to videos. And so mm-hmm. it was, it's, it's our way of, of helping at least 200 students, 200 families um, in, in ways, because we still do have a fairly unique value proposition. And there are lots of things that we're implementing to make sure that they've not make sure, but add some uh, accountability to them watching it. Mm-hmm. But mostly it's that conversation. If you've ever been to like a graduate level classroom and the professor starts asking you questions, like you read the whole book on day one. Right. <laughs> and, then, and then talks to you like you're, you're like, you have no business being in the class. If you can't answer appropriately and embarrasses you in front of the other students, that, that usually was enough for me to, to be prepared. And I think it will be for them too. You, know, you mm-hmm. come to these mentoring sessions and ask you a basic question. And, uh, uh, and I won't cut it. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, What are you guys learning about how to, I, I know you're in person a little, but doing all this virtual stuff, how right. to build the relationships that are like so important to your program? Like, how do you do that um, remotely? So we're uh, going to do some, those, so Zoom has this breakout room feature that mm-hmm. does allow for a little bit more, you know, intimacy, personal kind of getting acquainted stuff. Uh, but we do have that one hour of uh, in-person golf. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of what I was saying before. I don't think it's going to be anything near what it was, but I still think it can be enough of something. And I have to also say that we have been blessed immensely because we're midnight golf. Mm-hmm. So it's like um, a lot of students just want to be midnight golf. They don't even know what it is. They don't know, but they know they want it. They know they want to be part of it. And our network expands so far and for so long that, you know, they can wear a jacket and three years from now, you know, walk down a a college thoroughfare somewhere and somebody, Hey, you're a midnight golf and it will matter. So, um, it may not be as immediately um, impacted, but it's, there's, there's enough of a lifeline or there's enough of a land grab on the other side of this lifeline that if we can just get them across with some sense of, of who they are and then a real sense that you are midnight golf, 
um, that kind of uh, capacity to, yeah. to, to connect with other people will, will be evident and will be meaningful. Um, I mean, we haven't talked about that. Midnight Golf is an application program you have to apply to get into it. But so, I mean, I always think if you make something harder to be a part of, people like want to be a part of it. So, but what else has over the years sort of created that like cachet for Midnight Golf? Um, so, so first of all, you're right in that <laughs> supply and demand. I'm an economist by trade. <laughs> That's what rules the world. That's yeah. uh, every, almost every single engagement we have is, um, I want something that um, everybody can't have. So supply and demand, right. Now, it wasn't always that way. We used, we used to have to recruit for Midnight Golf inside, but I always used language that it was, uh, you were doing something special. But here's the truth. You better deliver. When yeah. you deal with young people, you can't lie to them. You can't have them out there selling your program if it's garbage. It has to really be honest. So it didn't take, it took us maybe four or five years. And um, then Shakira from the Brewster Projects has uh, her degree from Howard University and she's on her way to grad school. And you go, who, what, are you serious? No. Yes. So when other high school students can see that you have a history, you have a body of work, you have students who were exactly where I was. As a matter of fact, they told me to join, mm -hmm. um, that you really delivered, you really helped them, you really networked with them. You made the phone call, they got the job. You mm -hmm. found more money, they were gonna have to come home and you paid their book bill or you, you know. If you really deliver, that's what I love about working with young people. They have the greatest BS detectors on earth. They don't, and they sell it. We don't, as you know, we don't advertise at all. Uh, we had 1,800 applications. Um, Dang. Zero, zero advertising. We interviewed, uh, you know, almost 800 students this year. Zero advertising. And it's because the students talk about it. So I know you said you don't, you try not to sort of engage in the conversation about uh -huh. um, whether there are some young people who don't need or want to go to college. Um, but I am wondering if you would engage in that a little bit. So, mm -hmm. you know, most of the kids that you meet, mm -hmm. they want to go, right? Mm -hmm. So, most of them. um, yeah. So, so what do you think, uh, what do you think when, when you hear that argument a little bit, or when you hear people making that argument? Um, I, I'm not really good at debate. So that's probably part of the problem. The second is that, um, people are entitled to their belief systems. And so, um, all you need is, you know, well, you know, two chains didn't go to college. Well, two chains did go to college, but you just need somebody <laughs> somewhere who made it sure. that didn't go to college. And that's enough for you because you don't want to go to college. And that's fine. I, I, I don't know how to turn that mindset around. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've heard me argue many times about people describing, you know, jobs in the skilled trades. Everybody doesn't have to go to college. They can get a job, a job in the skilled trades. And, uh, you know, I don't know how much longer they're going to keep that, that foolishness up that you, because it's really stemmed and it's rooted in the fact that I can do terrible in high school and be a, a bad student and then get it, have a, have a hundred, a six figure plus career in skilled trades. Uh, that's not true at all. You have to be intelligent to be in skilled trades. You have to be incredibly smart to be an electrician. It is not hook the black wire to the black wire and the white wire to the white wire. That's over. Um, they came to fix my furnace the other day. They almost had on lab jackets. They had computer probes. They had a laptop and they were looking at the motherboard on my furnace in the basement to, to cut your heat right. Mm -hmm. So this whole notion about it, it um, I think it's, um, I think it's a fallacy that they're telling students. And then there's no data you can show me to support it. Yeah. I've looked at the data. There's no data anywhere that can tell that says that people who have, don't have a college education uh, do as well as people who have college educations. Not a drop of data. You can show me some people. Right. A lot, like, a lot of people. Anecdotes, right. Yeah. But, my, dad, my dad was a millionaire. He went to college for a couple of years. He didn't need, he didn't need college in 1970, 69, when he started his business. He didn't need college. He worked hard and could do all of that. That was a different time. 2020, but much different time. Yeah. Robots do most of the stuff that, um, uh, well, they do a lot of the things that people were doing from accounting to coding and 
and all. I also don't want people to, to go to college for things that they're building robots to do. And uh, robots are doing a lot of work right now. So, you know, we can talk about whatever we want, but I'm just telling you, medicine, engineering, law, writing, creation, creativity, believe it or not, uh, is being uh, impacted dramatically by artificial intelligence. And, and we got to wake up to that, that kind of stuff. What's, yeah. what's my unique value proposition? Right? Well, and speaking of unique value proposition, all the skills that we were talking about before, right? Like the, those human skills that yep. at least so far, we don't think computers are, are going to get really good at, you know? No, you're a million percent right. And as a matter of fact, there are lots of people who, you know, the, the, the big future thinkers, they, in fact, will tell you that's probably the only tangible foothold for a, a career success or, or professional success. Mm -hmm. It's in those six C's. Mm -hmm. It's not in being a best, you can't, you can't crunch numbers better than a robot. Right. Um, but you can talk strategy to your client better than a robot. Right. Um, you can't crunch uh, DNA data and better than a robot. I was at Tempest in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You can't do it better than they can do it. And it's all robots. Yeah. But you can use that analysis, use the data and talk to your, your patient in a way that's different that a robot can't do. So you got, it is the people side. Yeah. Young people right now, if nobody's watching me all day, we've got, we've got to get out of this whole thing that if I'm, nobody's watching me, I'm going to be goofing off. Um, that you can't do that. You've got to have the, if you're going to be successful in the virtual workspace, which I think is going to be a big part of our, our job options, the whole notion of going back into an office where people are, are managing you and watching you all day, I really think those are going to be very, very limited. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to have a lot of agency now. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to have much more in terms of self-awareness, capacity to self-start, mm -hmm. capacity to um, communicate with all these skills. Mm -hmm. A lot of our students are tech dependent, they are not tech savvy. Mm. You're going to have to be a lot more tech savvy. If some big thing doesn't get to the, into the room fairly quickly, the, the gap is going to be unfortunately, unnecessarily, um, it's going to be bigger than it needs to be when it's big by itself. Now, what you were saying earlier about this capacity to engage people and to be human and to be empathetic and to have, um, you know, thoughtfulness, um, and, and, and empathy, if we aren't focusing on those skills and uh, the capacity to even translate those skills over social or, or through these digital tools, we're going to have real, you're not going to, you're going to have real challenges uh, getting everything we want. Dave, thanks so much for having this conversation with me. Oh, this is great, Sarah. Thank you. Please join us for our next episode. We'll be talking with the superintendent of Meridian Public Schools, Craig Carmody. So before our students will leave high school, they will likely have done over 100 presentations in their life. We'd love to hear from you about how to make Michigan's education system work better for all kids. Please find us on social media.